I do think it's so important to study the history of feminism because I so often hear people say that feminism began with good intentions and it was a legitimate movement. Women had legitimate grievances. Uh, feminism in its early days was a sane, rational appeal for women to have equal rights with men and that it went wrong at some later stage in its development as a movement. And some people think it was fine up through the, what's called the second wave. Some people think it went wrong with the third wave. We could, get, we could talk about those waves if you want, but, um, and I, I hear that so often and I believed it myself um, until I really started looking critically at the texts and the major leaders of the early feminist movement. And I discovered that no, it wasn't the case. It was never sane. It was never without deep rancor and bitterness against men. It was never free from the claim that women were absolutely innocent victims of male um, predation. It was never uninterested in destroying the family. It was never uh, inaccurate in its claims about women's social situation. And it was never uh, fully willing to slander men in the most vicious and unpitying ways. Um, and it never expressed any um, appreciation for men or any recognition that men had ever made any contribution to society or that men had ever acted out of genuine love and concern and compassion for women in the laws that had been made or in the social arrangements that had been developed over time. It was just, yeah, it was always <laughs> really um, deeply uh, misandric, um, man-hating, man-blaming kind of movement. And I think that, that it's really important to know that so that mm -hmm. we, as you said, know how we got where we are. And, and my contention is that all the seeds of what we see now in the crazy, irrational, completely hysterical denunciations coming out of the mouths of, of feminist activists, all of that was there in the, in the early movement. So yeah, we could go back to around 1850, as you say, like some people would even say um, there were feminist discussions even earlier. You can go back to, I just did a video on um, feminist foremother, Mary Wollstonecraft. She was a British writer and philosopher and activist. And she wrote a, a, a pamphlet book, long essay, I'm not sure what to call it, called A Vindication of the Rights of Woman that was published in 1792. And it was already um, characterized by mm -hmm. same kind of thing, the, the double standards, the complete refusal to um, accept that women had any agency in the relationships that developed in the way women were in society, the, the, the blaming of men, always the crediting of men with the worst possible motivations in the laws they enacted or in, in their, their behaviors, always this utopian idea that if only women were free and given a lot of power, that the entire world would improve, uh, always the, the stress so, on, on, on women's superior morality. So 1792, that was the French Re Revolution. Yes. Yeah. Did she have anything to do with what was going on in the French Revolution? Or well, she, was she impacted by that? Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> Good question. Yeah. She, um, she was, I think, 30 years old when the French, French Revolution began in, in 1789. And she was part of the British circle of philosophers and radical thinkers, you know, progressives who were very impressed by the French Revolution and, and who, who were, um, as I think, intellectuals and others often are, were, were um, inspired by that idea of tearing down an imperfect social system, completely demolishing it and rebuilding a perfect order from the rubble. Uh, and, and so she went to the French, to, to, she went to Paris to observe the French Revolution up close 
She went there in actually after she'd written a vindication of the rights of woman um, shortly after. And she went at the time when the most vicious and vengeful aspects of the French Revolution were just getting into, into swing. Um, the, the really radical arm of the uh, revolutionaries, the Jacobins had taken power. They were um, you know, executing all of those who were seen as counter-revolutionaries thousands and thousands of people, some of them whom Wollstonecraft knew personally, were, were guillotined. And uh, she observed all that and yet remained committed to the ideals of the revolution. She was only saved from execution, at least potentially, because she was involved romantically with an American businessman, diplomat, and adventurer named Gilbert Imlay, who registered her as his wife with the Parisian government and thus saved her from execution as an American. And, uh, but yeah, she was there. She saw, um, she records that she, she stepped in the blood running in the streets from the number of people who were being executed and yet she could still defend the aims and the methods of the revolution as she did in a book that she wrote about it. So that, that revolutionary spirit, uh, that utopianism, uh, that has a deep role in a great deal of feminist ideology that was developed at that time and later, the idea that we can, we can change human nature by changing our society. And the, the rejection that there is anything fundamental in human nature, the rejection of the idea that anything we've developed over time, it has been developed because it worked, you know, to some degree, which is the, you know, the conservative kind of view, I guess, that, that the, the, the society that's passed down to us should be at least respected, even if we want to change things in it, it should be respected as something that established a way of, of, of working that that was functional, um, but the the utopian mindset that we often find in feminism and in other forms of progressivism completely rejects that, and we see that very clearly in in Wollstonecraft. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so she was in. She was a British woman. She was a British woman. Yes, she was a British woman. Um, and it, I read something. Uh, or I, I heard something on your YouTube video. She didn't take into consideration the difference between uh, the career a woman could have and whether, and whether she, she would do uh, be fulfilled by being at home with children and taking care of a house that um, she, she couldn't see the idea of having children, being married, being fulfilling without a career. Is that is that accurate to what she was thinking yes, way um, back then? Yes, yes. Uh, she she was well, she made a kind of double edged and self contradictory argument in the sense that she agreed actually as many later feminists did not she agreed that that women's primary role in society would be as mother you know as wives companions, helpmates, and mothers. She agreed. Now, I don't know whether she, you know, really personally believed in that. She herself was a professional woman. She was a writer. Uh, and, and that was the thing that, that she deeply, deeply valued. Um, but, but her argument, which um, was a, sounded quite conventional, was that for women to be the best wives and mothers they could be, they deserve to be far more fully educated than they were, and they deserve to have professional opportunities to to you know bring their talents into the public sphere to do whatever. And that sounds good. And right? that, sounds that sounds good. good. I and I know that there's research that if women are educated, their children do better. And that was you the know, argument that she made. If if women good are argument. to, you know, if women are to be moral, virtuous citizens, and if they are to bring up their children to be good citizens, they they should be well educated. And so that that sounds great. I don't have, of course, any you know any disagreement with that. I believe that every person, regardless of the circumstances of their biology, you know, should be able to um, be well educated if they so wish, and and to bring their gifts to do whatever they're talented at doing. So so that was the argument. 
but um, but she did not seriously consider the tension that would arise between women's, what she said was their particular role as mothers to bring children into the world and to help them, nurture them, create a home for their husbands and families. And the other challenges, the other kinds of tension and stress and everything else that come from a public role. She never did acknowledge that there is a tension there. She simply asserted that women should do both and that this would make them better mothers. She even made the argument that um, that women would be more loving, more contented in their domestic roles, more genuinely attached to their husbands and children when they were given greater freedoms and, and greater opportunities and more power in the society. Now, she never really philosophically defended that position. Why would someone become more attached to the home when all of a sudden all of these other opportunities are, are granted? And I do think that's one of the continuing problems within feminism, maybe just generally within our society, is that what has tended to happen for a lot of women is that they have been interested in, in a career or at least been interested in um, a kind of life outside of their homes and have been, I think, often surprised by the stresses and boredoms and tensions and unhappiness that work outside of the home often involves. But rather than recognizing that that is just a, a thorny fact of life, many feminists and women in general influenced by feminism have, have seen that as something that is being denied to women specifically because they're women or imposed on women specifically because they're women and have said, you know, we, we are owed something to fix this, whether it is state, um, state mandated and state paid for daycare so that, you know, somebody else can look after my children. Of course, that creates all sorts of problems and, you know, emotional stresses, etc. cetera, or uh, that the workplace should change to accommodate women's particular circumstances um, which also creates its own set of problems and expectations and women feeling that they are judged as, as less professional um, because they have certain home responsibilities. Like there are just so many problems that arise out of that assertion that women should be able to have both. And, 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 and rather than recognizing that as just a, a fact of the matter that has continued as, as one of the major complaints of feminist ideology, that this is something that, that the state or that men in particular owe to fix, you know, owe, owe women to, to, to fix it. And it's, it's a very difficult problem to fix.